right. Hey everybody, this is Kevin James of the Platinum Network, Platinum Vibes TV, and Platinum Music Magazine. I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with a legendary quartet of musicians, siblings in fact, who have amassed over five decades in music. Collectively and individually, they have worked with and shared the stage with some of the most iconic names in music, names like Curtis Mayfield, War, The Temptations, Ramsey Lewis, Stephanie Mills, Frankie Beverly and Mays, and many more. These brothers are currently in the midst of a multi-city tour spanning into January 2024. I am honored to be speaking with the Wooten Brothers. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, right. Thank you, yeah. It's good to see you. Right. Thank you. Being here, yeah. we're having a good time already. Excellent. All right. So if you could please um, just introduce yourselves. My name is Reggie Wooten. I'm Roy Wooten. I'm Joseph Wooten. And Victor Wooten. Excellent. All right. So a fascinating thing to me is always when we see multiple members of a family, um, you know, choose the same path and journey in their careers, you know, like the Isleys, Jacksons, Osmonds. So what was the genesis of how you formed this? Was it, did it naturally manifest or was it more of, because I know different ages. So, you know, was it more of, okay, one person earns and then, you know, it just gradually, or was it just all together in some, some form of fashion? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I would say that it happened in stages because Reggie, Roy, and then Rudy was the saxophone player brother. He'd be sitting right here if we were here. He'd right in the middle. But mm -hmm. us three was the first, we were the first three to come. Yeah, all mm -hmm. of us were like within a year apart. Like wow. me and Reggie, 10 days were the same age. That's how <laughs> close we are apart. And then Rudy was just a year. Mm -hmm. So we just always loved music. Yeah. We just loved music. We were beating on boxes. We were just blowing tonettes, you know, making instruments out of soda straws and that kind of thing. And I think that love just carried on into us just playing. And then three years after Rudy, here comes Joseph. And so Reg is already playing string instruments. I'm beating on boxes, playing drums. Rudy can play anything has to do with winds. So when Joseph comes, I, I let Reg take over because I'm not sure how Joseph got to the keyboards, but we're starting to get a band number now, you know. Well, when um, we were living in Hawaii, my dad was stationed in the military in Hawaii. And uh, so Joe was five. And to me, he just looked like a keyboard player. He had keyboard player hands. So I said, try, try keyboards. The same thing with Victor. Victor looked like he had bass player hands. He was two. And so play, play the bass. And, uh, you know, you just have to feel and it looked like it felt like it was the right thing. And it was a positive thing anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, But like at nine years old, I really wanted us, all five of us to have a, a serious band for the rest of our lives. At nine years old, I, feel, wow. I felt like we could do this for the rest of our lives. So luckily they stuck with it. Mm -hmm. yes. But it's a strong mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. wow. And it was, it, was for, it was easy for us because like Reggie Roy and Rudy were born, boom, boom, boom. So they just like, they were, there was that part of the family. And then Victor and I came later. We were the two younger ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, from where I said, they were already really good. I don't ever remember them sounding like they were learning to play. They were always really good. So when Reggie, when Reggie at what I remember as a, at 10 and I'm five, Victor's two, when he said, if you do this, we can have a band. We, there was no hesitation. He was, he was already so good at what he was doing. And, and, and Rudy and uh, Roy was so good at what they were doing. It was just really natural for us to listen to him. And, he showed us one note at a time and from the very first lesson it worked <laughs> you know there was like there wasn't a time that i there wasn't a time that it, it seemed unattainable because he was a really a really good teacher he showed us really well and and we learned well enough that just three years later we were on the big stage with with war and a couple of years later with curtis mayfield and then we, just from day one we we sort of knew that from day one, we knew that we were a a unit and something different, and mm -hmm. we could we could see that we were we were something special, you know. I'll just add this: when, if I was two, that's my earliest memory mm -hmm. of it. Joseph was five. Reggie was only ten. I mean, when I turned two, Reggie wasn't even ten yet. So Reggie's nine or ten. Roy's eight or nine. Rudy's seven or eight. And and we're doing it. So the real story is how they got it. So 
You know, you know how Joseph and I, yeah. we learned from them, but how they got so good. That's mm. the real story. Wow. All right, yeah. That's <laughs> Fascinating. Wow, so young. I'm still thinking about you know, toy figures or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Just to put, put the circle in context, um, we, when Victor just learned to sign his name, he signed his first <laughs> autograph when we were opening for war, the group war. So that they yeah. had died, right? And so just nice. recently, we're still in touch with the harmonica player for war. And uh, Joseph wow. found uh, the autographs. I found the autographs, yeah, from war back in 1970. Wow. That he, they sent so Victor's us. born in, in 64. In the, in the 64. So, you know, we, it was summer of 64, so he hadn't turned six yet. He's still uh, in kindergarten. Son. Just learn to sign his name. <laughs> right. Picture of him signing his first yeah, I'm, the, wow. I'm the older brother, eight years old, like third grade or so. But the full circles, we were able <laughs> to show the harmonica player the autograph that he has gave to Vic and then all of us and so many years later, and we're yeah. still in touch. Sent him a picture of it. Yeah, like, wow. full circle. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we're still doing right. it. <laughs> right. So now, with all of your independent endeavors, you know, music, uh, playing out, performing. When uh, when did you decide four of us can go out on tour together? On the current tour? The current tour, yes. That's a good question as to when it actually, you know, solidified. We knew we wanted to do it for a long time. It was just time, but everybody's been busy. Joseph tours with the Steve Miller band. Yeah, 30 years. And, um, and Roy and I, for many years, have uh, tour with the, the banjo player, Bela Fleck, Bela yeah. Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Mm -hmm. But it's been busy with teaching and things like that. But back to the question, I don't remember when it finally solidified that we were gonna do it and carve out that time. Sometime. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it started to solidify more when we finally made a decision to go into the studio Still. and record. When we finally got everybody, we finally like got everybody's schedule to like to meet and we went to Victor's house and we actually did some recording and that sort of, that sort of made what we were going to do, that solidified what, how we were going to go forward. Mm -hmm. So from the recording, the recording started to have some plans, the recording was going to need a tour, some career planning, but the, I would say the, the record, that first getting together and actually recording some music for a purpose solidified why we're going forward. And that was sometime last year, actually, mm -hmm. when we first started that recording. So it takes a while to get things going. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Wow. So with that said, how's it going so far? I mean, when did it start? Wow. The tour, when did the tour start in? Uh, the tour started really just about a week ago. Yeah, yeah. A little, a little oh, over a week ago. Okay. Yeah, 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 this, really this is. particular one, you know, we, we were in Australia early in the year. That's true. We had done some just in April with us. But this particular tour with the new song and the new material and stuff. Yeah, it's so. exciting. Yes. Right. The, the sweat tour started on the 28th in Chattanooga. Yeah. September. Oh, thanks. Wow. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. yes. We're going through to January. Yeah. 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 We got, uh, we'll wow. take a break. We will take a break. We, you know, <laughs> Joseph and I have families and a few other obligations, teaching obligations and things. So we, we usually don't like to go out a whole lot more than two weeks, two and a half weeks, go home for a bit, check in go back out again. So, but yeah, we're going in and out. We'll be going through January and then uh, the next, yeah, May. and then we'll go to Europe. And that's May. Yeah, yeah, in late yeah. April and in May. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, hopefully a lot of more. Yes, <laughs> indeed, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, that's good to hear. All right, so <laughs> speaking of music, to the new music, um, how would you categorize the sound of this music that you're Forming um, has it um, will it change from your your self titled album effort from uh, years back? Well, this first release is a is a funk tune. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, it's, a, it's a funk tune. Sweat. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh it's funky. Right? Not gonna lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a line as it says, "Sweat is funky." I'm not gonna lie, because sweat will sting you when it gets in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> sweat is water and sweat is salt. If you can't feel this groove, it's, it's not, not my fault. fault. <laughs> and uh, and that's sort of the attitude. That sort of, but it's it's a song about uh, hard work. 
you know, hard work and dedication, dedication put to the test. You know, uh, the early bird catches the worm. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Yes, that, yes. Was, that was actually a question I saw in the YouTube comments. It seems that lyric resonated. But many people just left a comment with that lyric. Yeah, Something well, yeah. Like that really resonated with people. Right. You know where that's from? So I was watching watch the Super Bowl. I'm a big sports fan, mm -hmm. and I saw the the Eagles uh, that came up short. Very good, one of yeah. the greatest Super Bowls. First Super Bowl with two black quarterbacks. Somebody has to lose. Jalen Hurts, you know, comes up on the losing end, and like reporters do. To ask, yeah, you just, <laughs> just lost well, a Super lost. Bowl, <laughs> and the loss is still stinging. They say, you know, how does it feel wow. to just lose a Super Bowl? And he says, I don't see it that way. I see it as uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And I thought, man, that is really mature because I, I like Jalen Hurts anyway. I was never an Alabama fan, but I love Jalen Hurts, the way he carried himself on that team. So I wanted to put that on my Facebook page, and I wanted to make sure that I had it accurate. And I looked it up and realized that it's a Nelson Mandela quote. Yeah, it's right. Made me like it Nelson that much even, even even more. So here's this athlete quoting Nelson Mandela and letting his defeat bring out the best in him rather than, you know, letting, making him sulk. So I wanted to get that in the song. They say the early bird catches the worm. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. Yeah. Yes, yes, very. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a new phrase yeah. as well. I'm going to tell that to my wife. Right. <laughs> Thanks, <honey>. Yes, indeed. <laughs> She's getting on my case. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you win. Sometimes you learn. I, I, I will I'm add something. <laughs> uh, I will add something to the question what kind of song? It's a funk song, mm -hmm. but when you listen to it, you know that these musicians can play. Right. You know that mus the musicians, and I'm not saying that funk musicians can't. But you know that there's a lot more. So when you hear the album, you'll hear a whole lot more than just funk. Even right. when you hear some of this old music that we found recently from the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. you realize, wow, this, this is deeper than just dance music or funk music, or even deeper than just jazz music. So we like to play music of any type. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. So anyway, I just want to fill that in. And also, mm -hmm. it's, it's a funk. Uh, song, but because it has this kind of athlete music kind of connection, yeah. some people have called it like a, a workout anthem. You know, people like we already hear people say, I work out to this. <laughs> we're like, man, you gotta send those videos, man. We wanna see you working out. But somebody, mm -hmm. people say, what you have is a, you got a, a sweat workout anthem. You know, so, you know, we wanna send that workout challenge out there. I mean, we, we got started out of the bed. We can't. We were ready to go. Yes, that's, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. speaking about that before, totally surprised. I see that shocking. <laughs> you know, the king of the yeah. instruments playing. <laughs> like, what? Right. But it, <laughs> it's a, it, it was a comedic way mm -hmm. of of showing our dedication to music. Mm -hmm. It's a comedic way, but that's what it's saying. When we wake up, we go straight to music. We don't necessarily sleep side by side with instruments under the covers <laughs> anymore. Anymore, <yeah. laughs> but, that, but, but that's mm -hmm. the premise because part of part of the song is inspirational too. Six a.m. Yeah. Monday morning, no time for sleeping, no time for yawning. Yeah, oh. No day off, no vacation. Hard work, dedication, perspiration. It's time to sweat. It's working to get where you're working to get where you're going. Yeah, and yeah. they see us. They see us doing it. So. And it's yeah, nice, man. Yeah. You think about, you know, we used to live next door to this guy, this athlete, Jerry Manuel. And he's the only athlete coming out of high school that was drafted into professional baseball, football, yes. or basketball. And basketball. He could do either one. He could make his choice. Now, you hear about Kobe going pros from high school, LeBron going pros yeah. from high Bo school. Jackson but Bo sports. Jackson did two. Bo Jackson did two, but he was drafted yeah. to all three. He's the only one. It's a trivia question, but we live next door to him. Jerry yeah, Manuel, yeah. so we knew who he, who knew the answer to the question. But when you think about people like that, you know, they're getting up early. Their day is getting started, you know, yeah. before they have to go to work, before they have to get to school, and they're working yeah. on their craft. No time for sleeping, no time for yawning, you know what I mean? Yeah. Think about, you know, David Goggins, you know what I mean? He's up early in the morning running 50 miles, yes. you know, <laughs> getting it done, you know? Yeah, so in that anthem sense, it seems like a lot of people can get a charge out of that, that funk, that feeling. It's mm -hmm. time to drive, need some music to let's go, let's go. Yeah. Funk, it, will, yes. funk will just get your body moving. Yeah, yes, it, 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 it seemed like it's a good so, initial point to make 
on a project that's going to be more than that. But that's that's a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, 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 <laughs> and this is just my thought. Every time uh -huh. he says. Uh, the early bird catches the worm. I just think about Dennis Robin and all that hustle. The worm, yeah, the yeah. worm catching the rebounds, man. He's not even the tallest guy, man. Mm -hmm. He's catching the rebounds. Skinny. Skinny, hustling, finish the game, and he's on the bicycle, right? <laughs> just like, wow, man. Yeah. That that kind of energy, that kind of dedication is what this team is about. Indeed. Yeah, so with the album coming up, um, are there any collaborations or is it just four of you internally or you have any you know collaborators that you're planning on working with during this new project my my guess because the whole thing is not recorded yet my guess is that it'll probably just be us but you know life always throws nice curveballs yes so it, anything could happen mm -hmm. but i think the focus right now is, is the four of us i think that's what we've been wanting to do for our, our whole whole lives and it's, right. it's never quite happened the way <laughs> we wanted it to happen. and, and I, i'll mm -hmm. say it like this it feels like we're collaborating with ourselves because we stuck with it those young kids that started so long ago we are those young kids still doing it and so we did so much recording when we were young all of this new music showed up that we wrote when we were young so these oh, this see. new stuff that we're doing is collaborating with ourselves who wrote all that stuff back then so people are going to get a chance to hear how we've been doing it for so long. And they're all go so, so going to get a chance to hear the missing brother who played sax. That he was very good. Not He wasn't just good. He was very good. And, so and, people are going to get a chance to get and introduced. The, and to fill in that blank, our brother Rudy passed away uh, in 2010 at 51 years old. Yeah. Uh, too soon. But, uh, but we're going to make sure that people know who Rudy is. Yeah, and the the, wow. spe the super special thing about the way he played, he was a very good sax player, but he was also a master at blowing two saxes at once. That was his expertise. Yeah, yeah he had a, a a C melody and an alto saxophone, and he could blow in unison. He could blow in octaves. He could blow in diatonic thirds. He could do whatever he wanted. And uh, it, it'll be fun. It, it's fun collaborating with the brothers again, and it's fun collaborating with the old music. But it's also going to be gratifying to to introduce him to people that haven't heard him before. Yeah, and, and he was also a master of circular breathing. So this right. is where you play, and the the, the horn never stops. It sounds like a bagpipe. So he was a master right. of that. He actually taught celebrities that trick, that um, with technique two, with two horns. And he was circular breathing with two horns at the same time. Some of that's kind of on the record. Those long it was a show, lines. It was really a showstopper. But that was first two main things: circular breathing. For people to get that in context, uh, like we grew up with so many musical influences. So Rudy loved Charlie Parker. He loved Charlie Parker, great virtuoso, but he also loved John Coltrane. So he had an alto saxophone where he played like Charlie Parker, Cannonball, out of that precision, funky, just playing through changes. Rudy could do all of that. Then he had a, a C melody, which was close to a, a tenor. And that, that on that side, he sounded a lot like John Coltrane. He could play like that because Coltrane was like, whoa, he was on it, right? Then when he played two, he heard Rashawn Roland Kirk, who was a blind saxophone player that could play three horns on a nose flute and everything. We're hearing it. Wait, there's one guy doing that? So he loved that too. So with Rudy, he's pulling in this whole saxophone tradition. Hmm. With one guy, you got Charlie Parker running over here, train over here, Rashawn Roland Kirk, he's circular breathing. So he was just a one man like phenomenon, you know? Yeah. And so it's going to be nice to, you know, when we talk about collaborating right now, I think we're focusing on how we're collaborating with ourselves mm -hmm. to tell us, tell this story right. of longevity, lasting, sticking to it, not giving up when the, when the going gets tough. Like my, my dad said, when the going gets tough, it's a positive signal. Keep charging. How we just kept, kept going, you know, so. Yes. So you know, I want to tell you, I've seen some live clips and the thing which uh, stuck out to me was not only does the crowd get a listening experience and visual as well, you're teaching as well. I've seen you you're doing um, measures, um, the time measures, um, uh, yeah. scales, keys, which mm -hmm. is fast because I still struggle with the keys. Well, so I'm like, wow, it's look it. at that. Yes. <laughs> Where did that all, why did that all start? Well, uh, in my mind, music already is bringing everybody together. Not just some people, not just people, you know, who 
think like you. Music brings all people together. And when these people come together, we f- kind of forget what life or what society tells us is supposed to be important. I'm only supposed to like you if if we pray to the same person or if I the voted Democrat. for the same person or if I, <laughs> yeah. music just not, nah, you know, we're all just grooving. So my thought is that since people are already here uh-huh. and giving themselves to us, mm-hmm. let's give them back something useful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's just give them something useful. And so uh, knowing that people are listening, what are we going to say? And there's a lot of musicians out there that maybe aren't saying the things that we should be hearing, especially kids should be hearing. You know? Right. Yeah, I tour manager Jack right here. Jack does sound for us. Jack? Jack's the one that helps us tell that story. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> but my, my, my thought in, in my own head is that when people come to hear you play, they're giving you complete almost complete control if you say go buy my t-shirt they'll go do it the people who don't like you aren't there so everybody that's there is totally giving their whole thing you know so i want to for me personally i want to make sure that we're we're giving them back something that's can potentially make their lives better worth taking worth yeah worth taking in that's a better way of saying it. something that's worthy we could sing some lyrics that, you know, they'd sing back because whatever we, we sing, they're going to sing it back. Yeah. So why not do something that our parents would be proud of? And that if they said it to their kids, their kids will uh, benefit from it also. So we just try to be, I mean, I don't even think we're trying to do it. We were just, we were raised that way. So, you know, yeah. Some, sometimes in society, people need to be, reminded when they're at their best so they can remember it. So there's a part in the show, I'll tell them, you know, remind them that people will tell you that, you know, we're so divided that we can't go forward, you know, and- uh, As people. Yes. As people, and I'll remind mm-hmm. them this, and when they tell you that, uh, you know that it's not true because we're doing it now, that we're doing it right now. And that's that's kind of what music is for, it puts, it. it takes human beings and brings out the best in us. We're on the planet to be together, so we come together to hear it. We're yes. on the planet to be creative, so we create music. And it's a situation where nobody loses. Like, wins and losses are good. Everybody wants to be a winner, but nobody <clears throat> nobody wants to volunteer to be a loser, right? And the music mm-hmm. has all the benefits of winning without anybody having to lose. And that's... That's why I like it. It brings out the best in us. Yeah, it just made me think of that. We we grew up, at least the first three, um, when we grew up in a time when society is pressed against you. Society just doesn't like you. The mm-hmm. cops look at you sideways. They do now, too. But then that was the order of the day. Absolutely. Now people mm-hmm. don't expect it. Back then, you kind of expected it, right? So when an artist like Curtis Mayfield says, we're a winner, and everybody knows it, too. Right. It's like, we actually need to hear that from our artists. They got a microphone. So they're not just saying anything just to get sales or to make something, you know, a big hit. They're saying something to feed your soul. See what I'm saying? So I grew up Mm -hmm. in third grade. I asked the third grade teacher a question. And she said, you don't have a history. Your history is slavery. That was the answer to my question. In third grade. In third grade. Now, what question could I ask to get an answer like that? Like that society is leaning against you, man. Yeah. So, so, so music at the times. I'm glad you said that. That's what I was gonna say. I'm a. You're a shining star, no matter who you are. Right. Yeah. Keep keep your reach. Keep your head to the sky. Yeah. It's a family affair. Everybody is a star. Everybody. This this is what there was. You know. Thank so you so even if you're here. a kid that doesn't know what that means, but you're singing it anyway. It's like you don't know that this food is good for you, but you eat it, you're better, whether you know it or not. Mm-hmm. So the food, uh, the music is like that. Yeah. Right? You don't take a vitamin and focus on it. You don't have to. Mm-hmm. It's going to do what it does. Mm-hmm. And so we want music that's going to do something good for you, whether you know it or not. Every and day people. To add to that also, <laughs> is it when, when, even when racism was the law, like there's a line, there's a rope down the middle, Black folks have to go this way. White folks have to go that way. Mm-hmm. When the groove was right, instinctively they would ignore the law. They jump over the rope, right? Music Back in those days, music brings people together if you do it right. Yeah. 
So, you know, we're trying to cover all the bases. We're saying the right thing. We're doing it the right way. And we're providing a groove in a situation that solves a lot of it for the moment. And, and at the risk of sounding egotistical, our musicality is at a high level. Been doing it for a long so time. whatever <laughs> you came for, probably gonna get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, taste, you know. Yeah. <laughs> one one story remind me about how music helps to just cut through everything was a uh, down south, something like Muscle Shows, where they did all them soul records down south in Alabama, somewhere it was KKK country, man. And dude asked mm-hmm. the KKK guy, he said, Man, y'all are right around the corner from this this record. A uh, place that makes all these soul records. Like, how come y'all never gave them no problems? And the KKK just said, because the music was so good. Because <laughs> the music was so good. <laughs> you know, I mean, we had everybody coming down there. See what I mean? Music is, is a tide that lifts all ships. Um, I noticed the theme, I'm um, just uh, reading about you guys. Um, I noticed the theme of education and teaching. I've seen TED Talks. Um, sessions. So yes, I've seen that theme. I'm um, kind of answered it before, but where does this this passion and joy for teaching, um, sharing your knowledge, you know? Well, that's that's, his name is the teacher. We'll start with <laughs> I teach all the time. Um, mm-hmm. I teach every day, seven days a week, no days off. Um, whatever mm-hmm. I do, I'm going to have a passion at it. My mm-hmm. first passion is playing, but mm-hmm. um, but I'm teaching the kids and I'm making my my life with the instrument in my hand. So, um, but yeah, just playing music. You know. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep life fun. To me, that's the passion everybody should seek anyway. Mm-hmm. Pleasure and fun. Kind of in school, they kind of teach you work, work, work. But when I teach every day, it's play, play, play. And that's kind of how we grew up. I was always trying to make sure they had sweet cereal and <laughs> they could buy toys they wanted. It's always a pleasure thing, no pressure. I've always felt that and I still feel that way. Don't put any pressure on anybody. You show how pleasurable life can be. So that that's even more than passion to me because everybody seeks pleasure in life. That's how we came to this planet is through pleasure. <laughs> you can't <laughs> pleasure. Yes, yes. So to me, you're actually starting to leave life. You're starting to deteriorate. Or you're leading towards death. When you get away from pleasure, and to me, so I don't call pleasure a passion. I guess you could love is a passion, but yeah, but the ha- wanting to have happiness in life is just whatever that is survival, music almost. There's no explanation for it. So that's kind of what it, I, the way I teach. You see, me? I'm trying to, and so I'm not saying it's a passion, but I can tell that with my students, there's a there's a need for that. Like you need to learn the other side of life, the pleasure side of life. And one thing else I say that pleasure, when understanding pleasure is a lot more dangerous than work because people look at Jimi Hendrix and so many people that died at 27 once they reach their success. See, nobody's preparing you for success. Everything coming in your hand, everything's going your way. Girls, drugs, money, uh, opportunities, uh, celebrity ship. You see what I mean? Yeah. So pleasure needs to be studied and practiced. To me, it's a big hole in the pleasure side. Yes. Ego kicks in. People get off track so fast. Mm-hmm. So that's so that's a passion, but it's really I see a big need in that that direction, mm-hmm. making people mm-hmm. happy and understanding it, know how to handle it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, people water it down, which to me it needs to be watered up. So that's my <laughs> side. Yeah. 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 Drastically, you know, yeah. that's why the world just keeps going down and down. They don't know any better. Yeah, and it, you know. People dying too early or whatever, <clears throat> falling for everything. Everybody's falling for everything, and just tell them anything. The wind come blowing me the way. I think the pleasure side will make them see who they are. Build your own self up. Yes, yes. The uh, where that technique. Play. Yes, 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 indeed. Before we lift our guitars up. Play, yeah, you know, face to face. Yeah, and play each other's instrument. Yes, indeed. Yeah, a lot of that stuff comes from Reggie, and. I get a lot of credit for some of that stuff, spinning the bass around, you know, double thumbing, tapping. I get a lot of credit, but, you know, 99.9% of it is something Reggie gave me the idea for, or just outright said, man, if you do this, people will go crazy, you know, whatever. He's been doing that since I was ever playing, you know? So uh, yeah, came from Reggie. 
Yeah, but you're talking about that thing where we face each other and play our guitar. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. That's the yeah. guy Red's taught. Actually, right. a guy that I taught, um, guitar player, we call him Ten Finger Orchestra, and he plays in Joe's band. But um, mm-hmm. when I met him, he didn't want to do it. He's from the West Coast, and he didn't want to do any of that stuff. He moved to Nashville. He didn't see the reasoning for playing extracurricular guitar. <laughs> you know, um, I was trying to get him to tap and slap and single note. I was trying to say, you probably really need this sometime, but he couldn't understand it. Um, I kept saying, what happens if you play in Victor's band? Or what happens if you play with Joe's band? Or Roy Futureman's band? You might need a little extra because they're doing extra stuff. Um, but luckily, but he kept taking lessons. And, uh, and then when he got with Joe's band, I saw him flower, like develop. He was doing everything, um, everything I tried to show him, and even more, uh, his own flair. I guess um, Joe showed him the need for it. But then uh, later on, he came back and showed me this move. Um, I didn't make it up. When we take, I, I lift my guitar up in, and I play Victor's guitar. He plays mine at the same yeah, time. Yes. I call it sticky hands, like in martial arts or something. Yeah, but uh, so, so the music, like, um, you know, it helps you. You know, I, I help them. They help me right back. It came, that came out of his head. 100%. I didn't make it up. And so I'm now um, I'm benefiting from what he showed me. And I can see that he benefited from what I showed him. And that circles back to your question mm-hmm. when you talked about teaching. And this teaching is almost like you're sharing. And then when they get the aha, they share it back to you. And then you get something back. It completes a circuit. And one example, Leah was talking about earlier, Red, is mm-hmm. how when you taught, it's a good example. You, you, Red's taught Vic how to use his thumb like a pick. Where you use it, most people use the and thumb going pick, one yeah. way, yeah. right? This big thumb was too small. And did you show him the plug or what? How, how did well, that Well, nineteen seventy three with Larry Grant, like well, the way already fucking. Okay, but I just wanted, yeah. I wanted him to show how Vic came up with something from something that Red showed him. But Red said Vic, it, it was something totally new. I just want to see if you could share. This is a good example of what we did on the, the yeah. Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday. for this one. Well, I can remember. Um, you know, Victor was so small. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as far as being a professional bass player in the grown-up world, yes. these guys are real small. <laughs> so I remember, <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, you know, I was considered I was eleven, twelve years old. I've been sitting old already. <laughs> 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 these and but these guys are young and they're turning it out, making me look old. But I remember with Victor, um, to get him to shine, uh, we did this had his thumb go down on the bass. Then we figured out that he could play even faster because thumb went down and up like my guitar pick. But I was double thumbing way back then. In 1973, Larry Graham came out and showed us how to thump and pluck. But a thumb acted like a bass drum and, a, and the pluck acted like a snare. Boom, pa, boom, boom, pa, we will rock you. That kind of thing. Right, so I showed him that. And then Victor, he already knew how to double thump. But what Victor did, he synthesized it another way. He was on the road with the platters. First time I heard it, Victor called me on the phone from Florida, I think it was. And uh, also, he was rolling on the bass. I had no idea what he was doing. He kept saying, I'm just doing what you said to do. I'm just like, no, man, I have no idea what you do. And I'm listening hard, too. Like, and he's got the notes in there, too. I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe he's got two hands helping out. And all of a sudden, he's got the notes playing at the same Sweet time, chords. no way on the phone you could figure out what he was doing. Something totally new that came into the world. Yeah. But he synthesized, you know, what I was saying, down go down and up with the pluck and <laughs> and and then pull too. But then later on, he came up with down up with the thumb and then plucking with two fingers. That had never been done before. So, this, so, so what people call double thumbing now, uh, the way Victor's doing has never been on the planet before. That's what I mean, but he thought he was doing what, what he was supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> then he's double plugging, and now he, so that the way he's playing is the standard for bass now. You know, which I'd said all along. I always told him a long time ago: the way you're playing, everybody's going to want to feel like that. Same thing with Joe. Hey, but you said, I, I said that a long time ago. Well, I'm just glad it's happening. Mm-hmm. But that's how it goes out. Full you know, you keep goes it goes out and back. it comes back. Yes, different. Yes. I'm doing his technique now on the guitar, <laughs> and that's the. <laughs> That's the benefit of one of the benefits of teaching is that unlike unlike linear giving, like I have a dollar and I give you 50 cents. Now I got 50 cents and you have 50. 
in teaching, you give it away and it grows. Right. You give it away and the idea grows. He gave that to Victor. Victor turned it into something else. Now they both have yeah. more. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. never been on the planet before. Yeah, Take and that's uh, you. It's a it's a good way to do things, and it, it teaches by example too. Other people want to join in and and have some of what you have, so they become givers too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just the benefit of music. It leaves the world a little bit better. A little bit better. You're a little bit better by engaging with it, either creating, creating it, teaching it, learning from it, going to it. You're a little bit better than you were before you engaged in it. Yeah. So that sharing is just beautiful. How it comes back. So that was a literal example. And you look around, you see everyone is convinced, is is attracted to to learning how to do it too. We're not forcing anybody to play like that. People are just magnetized Gravity. to it. Gravity. Gravity. You know, we yes. just continue the lineage, man. Sharing it. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt that we're brothers either. It's <laughs> <laughs> a natural. Yes. Natural. Yeah. Um, so, what's up? I know you have the show tonight, but what's up next for the Wooten Brothers? Um, upcoming <laughs> cities, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got, we got upcoming cities. We got, new we got music. new music. We got new people to meet. And the inspire and the good thing about like being new music, the tour is like the uh, the the environment is very ripe for new possibilities. So there's new possibilities that are coming in the side door. That instruments, yeah, new instruments are being invent- yeah. invented, new music's being created, new opportunities for the music. Uh, it's coming. It's a. It's a. It's an exciting time, right. and it's a time that we've been waiting for for a long time because we we've had separate careers. We never yeah. stopped being brothers, but we're just in different places. They're, they're flectoning, teaching seminars, base camps. He's got students every day, a million gigs. I've been with the Steve Miller Band for thirty years. Like as soon as I come off of this tour, I go back and play with the Steve Miller Band some more. As soon as I come off with him, I come back and play with this. But this is the Steve Miller band. I love playing with the Steve Miller band. But, you know, this is what I was born to do. And the other things are what I like to do. This is what I'm born to do. And we have a bunch of old music. Yes. Yeah, that's really, really exciting. Some old and music so that people will give a chance to hear from Brother Rudy, our yes. brother, as well as this old music is exciting us. Because it was yes. music we had forgotten about. Yeah. A whole bunch yes, of so. original new music. And so we're really excited. Yeah, because I forgot how good we was. Like, oh, this is some good <laughs> stuff right here. <laughs> we were like, okay, okay. And uh, but also with that uh, older music back there, we have the old documentary footage and stuff too that we have access to. Because years ago there was a documentary going to be done on our family, and, and now we have access to that old footage. So even on the next tour, there's going to be you know images and, and stuff, and so we're going to be storytelling and letting people. You know, see some of the story and the journey that we've been on. So it's an exciting time, man. Yeah. Oh, it's it's time. time. It's time. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. All right. And thank you for allowing yeah. us to tell you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Oh, yeah. wow. Privileged well, enough. This is, you know, we're the, the music. <laughs> the music makers need somebody to help us tell the story. Right. So what you're doing is yeah. is as integral as what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. We're we're feeding each other. We thank you. For thank, that. You thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, indeed. It's a pleasure. Indeed. So, hey, everybody. Once again, it's been a privilege and honor here speaking with the Wooten Brothers before their show tonight in Brooklyn, New York City. Yes, indeed, the Big Apple. So, hey, I wish them an awesome show and uh, continued success on your tour and recordings. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yes.